Yeah, it's great to know all about it, isn't it? So great to see everyone here today. It looks like the house is full. That is fabulous. We've got a lot of exciting things going on in the next, at least the next six weeks. We've got uh, next week, uh, Billy Graham and Franklin Graham couldn't be here, but they sent us a, a DVD. And so we're going to be uh, looking at the value of a soul. And uh, I'm not sure what, uh, how many years old uh, Billy Graham is going to be on Friday. Does anyone know on Friday the 7th? Yeah, one of the high 90s. Um, and so uh, this is the latest release. They're not putting it out on television. Their strategy is to bring it right into the local church. And so we will be showing that next Sunday morning. The other thing is, uh, you saw in your bulletin, we will be showing Do You Believe? Now that's uh, probably still in some theaters, but we do have the uh, broadcast rights for it. So we will be showing that on Friday night, November the 13th. And then the next four weeks, the next four Sundays, we'll be having a message along that line. Because, uh, again, the key, and we'll show the trailer next week, but the key opening is, do you believe? The, the elderly man with the cross dragging it through the streets, he comes up to a guy in a car and says, do you believe? And the guy says, well, yeah, I'm a pastor. And the guy says, well, what are you doing about it? Ouch. You know, that's why this thing this morning, yeah, we know about it. What are we doing about it? And so that's going to be uh, next Sunday, the, the uh, Franklin Billy Graham uh, DVD. Then the following four weeks will be Do You Believe? And then on the 13th of December, we're having a baptism. And so anyone who's been thinking about that baptism, let me know. Let's get involved with that. And uh, that's great. Uh, daylight savings time. I, I saw where... An American Indian was, was being interviewed, and he said, the United States government is the only group of people who thinks you can cut three inches off the bottom of a blanket and sew it to the top of a blanket and it do, that it does any good. And so, you know, we have, we have this thing that's confusing. What, Judy said this morning, what time is it? I don't know. I don't know what time it is. Thank goodness the telephones now switch over by themselves because that was, that was a mess before. And then this morning was a real joy. Uh, we, we had uh, five of our grandchildren with us with, for a trunk or treat last night. And they all five stayed over. And uh, so getting ready with five kiddos this morning, uh, Judy has all the credit to be taken. And uh, it's a challenge that we haven't had in a long time. And we probably won't have five of them <laughs> together over Saturday night together at the same time. <laughs> uh, well, I've just probably been outvoted. All right. Um, this morning we're going to be... Uh, you're going to need that pew Bible because we're going to be looking at a section. I'm not going to have you turn it all over, but grab that pew Bible. If you have the burgundy pew Bible in front of you, it's page 270. And if you have that other color uh, pew Bible, it's going to be close to that. But we're looking at 2 Kings chapter 2. Now last week, we looked at how strong is your commitment. And we were looking at uh, Isaiah. We're going to be looking at 2 Kings chapter 2, and we're talking about Elisha and Elijah. Now, I am going to do my best to keep those two names straight without dribbling on myself, Elisha and Elijah. Elijah is the prophet of God, and he chooses Elisha to be his follow-up, to be the one he leaves his legacy to. And so we're going to be looking at a few things there. Find 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2. And we'll read it together. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2, verse 9. Elijah, or when they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. 
Verse 10, you have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Now, the reason he said that, because he had done 14 miracles. He had done 14 things that had not been done before. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise it will not. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would be with us now this, uh, during this study, and we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds so that we can learn something from your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me see. If my watch says quarter to one. So <laughs> the game starts at one. No, no, no. That means I got to go real fast. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll talk fast. You listen fast. Here we go. Going back to 1 Kings chapter 19. You don't have to turn to that. We'll just go. Elijah came upon Elisha when he was plowing in a field. And the scripture said he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Now, if we were driving down a field, or driving out in the country, and we saw a farm with twelve tractors plowing in the field, we would say, wow, that is a big farm. That is a rich person. That is the case here. Twelve yoke of oxen was a big deal. And a yoke of oxen was equal to the price of today of a tractor. Elijah means my God is Yahweh, talking about Jehovah. Elisha means my God is salvation. So Elijah came up to Elisha and threw his mantle over him. And that was a way of signifying that he had been called to be his uh, predecessor, his, or his uh, apprentice. And so verse 20 tells us, Elisha left his, 12, uh, his oxen, ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my mother and my father goodbye. And, and, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? Now, in the old English, that kind of sounds cumbersome. Basically, Elijah said, I will not stop you, but remember God has anointed you as my replacement. So he said, let me go back and kiss my mother and father goodbye. So he went back. And uh, verse 21, 22 tells us that he killed the two oxen that he'd been plowing with. He took the wooden implements, the plows and that, and used that to build an altar. And then he fed the people that were there. And then he left to follow Elijah. I would say that he just destroyed the way he was earning a living. He left his old life. I'm not sure how, it doesn't say... Uh, how happy Papa was with him, <laughs> that he killed the oxen and, and made a barbecue for everybody. But the bottom line is Elisha said, I'm going to kiss my mother and father goodbye. I'm leaving my old life behind. So we come to level one. And if you have the bullet and insert, fill those things out. I think you'll find this helpful as, as you go through the week, but as you go through your life. Level one is Gilgal. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. The place, this is the place in the plains of Jericho, the east side of the Jericho, where the Israelites first encamped after crossing the Jordan River. This is in Joshua chapter 4 and 5. Here they kept their first Passover in the land that God had promised them. And they kept their first Passover. They renewed the rite of circumstance, uh, circumcision. Excuse me. And so they were rolling away the reproach of Israel. See, they hadn't worshipped for many years when they were in Egypt as slaves. Because they didn't have a tabernacle. They didn't have a temple uh, that they could worship at, that they could sacrifice. For over 400 years, there had been, the children of Israel had not worshipped the Lord. Gilgal is the place where they turned back to God, where they instituted their religious worship, where they started sacrificing again. 
Now, the children of Israel could not move forward with God until they left their past behind. Remember seeing it there sometimes when you're coming complaining to Moses and say, Oh, we wish we had the leeks and garlics. Really? You know what that stuff does to your breath? I mean, they were slaves back there. They built the pyramids out of, you know, with slave labor. And all they could think about was garlics and, uh, garlic and onions? Come on. We remember the story of Lot and his family when they were pulled out of Sodom and Gomorrah and they're on their way out of town and then Lot's wife looked back and what happened to her? Anybody know real quick? Turned into a pillar of salt. They were told by the angel, don't look back. That's not the place you want to be. But she looked back with desire. Chapter 17 of Luke's Gospel, Jesus told us, remember what happened to Lot's wife. She looked back at her old life with desire. If you grasp and cling to life on your terms, you'll lose it. But if you let that life go, you'll get life on God's terms. So the bottom line is, if you want to fully experience the blessings of God, you've got to kiss something goodbye. You've got to kiss your old life goodbye. You've got to get away from it. You've got to forget it. You've got to put your eyes on Jesus and you have to move forward. 2 Kings chapter 2 says, When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elisha had completed level one, Gilgal. He kissed his old life goodbye. Verse 2, Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as surely as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Bethel. Now here's something interesting. They're in Gilgal. And, and Elijah said, Okay, wait here. I'm going on. And Elisha said, No way, Jose. Well, not exactly no way, Jose, but you got the drift. Of, I'm not going to leave you. Now, here's the thing. Elisha didn't fight with him, did he? Elijah said, okay, come on. See, it was a test. Every once in a while, you and I will have a test in our lives where the Lord gives us an opportunity to stay right where we are. But do we want to move forward? Or do we want to stay right where we are? Elisha was not satisfied with staying where he was. He had kissed his old life goodbye, but he wanted to progress. And so he wanted to move on to level two, which is Bethel. Level two, there we go. All right. In the original Hebrew, Bethel means house of God. Bethel served as the, the ancient Hebrews, as an early point of communication with God and of entry into the Holy Land. We remember from our Sunday school days, uh, the, the ladder that went to heaven, well, that was at Bethel. Abraham had fled Egypt to escape a famine, and he returned to Bethel. So Bethel was the place where the Lord met with his people. When Jacob uh, was fleeing from the wrath of his brother Esau, he stopped for a night at Bethel, that's when he saw the, uh, the stairway. After Jacob's return to the Holy Land, Bethel was the second place where he and his family settled. There he set up an altar to God, and God spoke to him. If you want to fully experience the blessings of God, you need to hear the voice of God. You need to hear the voice of God. You need to kiss your old life goodbye, and you need to hear the voice of God. Now, as the clip showed us, it's one thing to hear, it's another thing to do. But how do you know to do if you don't hear? We need to, each and every one of us, hear the voice of God. And then level three is Jericho. Then Elijah said to him in verse four, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. It's claimed that Jericho may be the oldest continuous occupied city in the world. And the oldest walled city. Joshua sent spies to Jericho. We remember the story. Sent the spies. 
because it was a walled city. Yeah, it, it was definitely a walled city. I, I have here, Jericho was kind of on a, on a hill. And there was a hill that was about 12 to 15 feet high. And on top of that, they built a wall, which was an additional uh, 26 feet high, and it was 6 feet wide. And then there was a, an area that it had, it had water, and it would have been a moat, but it wasn't. It was a hill. And that was about six acres of land. So even if you made it over the first hill, you'd be a sitting duck for the guys up on the wall because the inside wall was 46 feet high. 46 feet high. It was an impregnable city. Now, the way in, in that day, the way they would take over a city is they would surround the city. Nobody got in and out. They'd starve them out. Jericho had wells inside with fresh water. They had just gathered their harvest, so they had food. The people of Jericho probably could have waited two years and waited them out. But the, the Israelis didn't have that kind of time. So what happened? God said to, to uh, uh, Joshua, okay, here's what I want you to do. March around the city. March around the city, one, uh, and don't say a word, just march around the city, go home. And then do it again the next day. Then do it again. Do it again for six days. And then the seventh day, I want you to march around seven times. And then I want you to yell, and the walls will come down. The city is yours. And that is what happened. Now, here's the crazy thing. Here's the crazy thing. If you want to fully experience victory and blessings in your life, You need to obey God when he tells you to do something that just doesn't make sense. You talk to any general, you talk to anyone who's ever studied the art of war, and they're going to tell you, march around the city seven days in a row and then yell. Yeah, I, I don't think that's going to cut it. Although sometime, well, never mind, I won't say any more about that. All right. Level four. Jordan. Elijah said to him, stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as surely as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. And when they were walking along and talking together, verse 11, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elijah saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Verse 13, Elijah then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. If you want to experience the blessings of God, you need to have faith and see your own miracle. We've talked about four levels of commitment. Gilgal, where you've got to kiss something goodbye. Bethel, where you need to hear the voice of God for yourself. Jericho, where you need to obey something God has told you to do that just doesn't make any sense. And if you, could, if you make it that far, you will have, be able to have faith and see your own miracle. In case you haven't been paying attention to what's going on in the world, there's this little thing called the uh, World Series. Uh, for you football fans, it's kind of like the Super Bowl of baseball. When an individual decides to join a team and suit up to represent that team, there's the challenge of doing the best job you can and helping your team make it all the way. Here's a page out of the 1920 book called Naughty Problems. Lee and I were talking, uh, he's our resident baseball expert. As a kid I loved baseball, but baseball didn't love me. 
I didn't have the hand and eye coordination. Uh, so I, I wasn't able to catch. I wasn't, wasn't able to bat. I wasn't, I wasn't able to pitch. You know, uh, I, I was able to watch. Um, although I was not athletic, I was always an athletic supporter, but that's another subject. Um, but in Spalding's athletic library, it talks about how important it is for the batter, the runner, to touch first base. And it, it, it explains how to do it here, but uh, since we're close on time, 53 and a half years ago, there was a team called the New York Mets. Well, you might have heard of them. They're playing. Marvin Eugene Throneberry. He's best remembered as starting first baseman for the 1962 New York Mets. One time he hit a triple in a game against the Cubs, but he was called out for not touching second base. The manager was a fiery guy, Casey Stengel. He came out to argue the call, and the ump said, Casey, don't bother arguing about second base because he missed first base too. The next batter hit a home run, prompting Stengel to come out, to the dug, out from the dugout running and pointing out every base that was there because he didn't want him to miss a base. Sadly, though, Thor Throneberry's mistake was, co uh, was proved costly. The Cubs won the game 8-7 to seven just because this guy missed first base. Do you think that during the, the World Series game, hitting coach Kevin Long says to his players, don't forget to touch first base. Level one, first base. You got to touch first base. How about Pat Rossler, the assistant batting coach? How about Tom Goodwin, the first base coach? How about Ryan Ellis, the hitting coordinator? You think they're being a pain in the neck, reminding their players that if they hit that ball, I mean, that's one thing I remember about baseball, the manager saying, I don't care how far the ball goes, forget the ball, first base is your goal, you get the first base no matter what, don't stop. If you miss first base, I'm sure these guys are telling their players, it will affect you for the rest of your life. It could cost you your career. You'll still be on the, you know, you may still be on the team for a while, but you will not be a popular person. I submit to you that level one, just in baseball, level one is touching first base. And in the Christian life, level one is going to Gilgal and coming to a place in your life where you're willing to turn your back on that old life and you're willing to kiss that life goodbye. If you're going to move on, you've got to kiss something goodbye. By the way, if you look it up, Elisha did 28 miracles in his ministry, double of what Elisha did. 14 miracles was wonderful, but Elisha did 28. He said, you know what? I want a double scoop of God. When we sent our boys off to college, when we sent our boys off to college, I did not want our boys to go to college with a faith in my God. I wanted my boys to go to college with a faith in their God. Because if it didn't work out for them, that was going to be their problem. See, uh, my faith in my God was not enough for my boys. I trained them so they would have their faith in their God. That they needed to kiss their old life goodbye and be wholly dedicated to God. This is a time that if you need to do business with God, if you need baptism, if you need counseling... This is the time. Steffi's going to come. We're going to sing. I'm going to be down at the front. Let's all, bow, let's all stand and bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we pray that you'd take these words this morning. We pray that you would be with us 
as we analyze our lives to see if we've given it all to you or if we're just memorizing the words, if we're talking about the words, but we're not putting it into action. In your name we ask, amen.